And again, peace, family. I'm Brother DJ with Us Lifting Us Economic Development Cooperative. Uh, and this is another Sonetta exclusive. Brother Sonetta is here in Atlanta. Uh, we summoned him down uh, to come down and engage in some serious work with the family in Atlanta. And, um, and, and a part of our conversation is that I wanted him to interview and dialogue with some of the key elders in the Atlanta community. And so I had to really lay out to get Brother Sonetta to commit to even making a 20-hour trip to Atlanta. I had to lay out something to him that was so powerful and convincing. Once I just kind of gave him a snippet of the, of the story, the brother said, I'm there. You know, I, I got to get this and because the family needs to hear this story. So without any further ado, I want to introduce to uh, to you all um, Baba Hekima Kenyama and his wife, Mama Tamu Kenyama. And we're going to go into some of their history um, in the in our movement. But the first thing I want to want to uh, throw out there or ask is is for Baba Hekima to kind of give uh, his early development where he's from. Um, and how he grew up, and what some what are some of the things that actually led him to the to the uh, university where he and Mama Tamu eventually met. So just give us a little bit of your history in terms of early development. Uh, greetings, family. Uh, I'm originally from Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, graduated from high school in uh, six. And of course, the uh, sit-ins were uh, uh, around in the South and in Charlotte and others, other communities. Uh, uh, and of course, you know, the, the, the water fountains, you know, and other uh, uh, signs do, uh, designating these as white only uh, uh, tools or facilities were prominent, you know, segregation in that sense. So when I got to the university, I went to, um, uh, North Carolina Central University in Durham. Uh, we talked about Durham a little earlier in terms of Black Wall Street. And, uh, but when we got there, uh, I joined CORE very early and uh, became a part of the sit-in demonstrations. What, what does CORE? Um, uh, Congress on Racial Equality. <laughs> and uh, under the leadership of Floyd McKissick. And uh, so we were demonstrating at the... Uh, lunch counters, at the restaurants, and any number of places. And so my first arrest occurred uh, in Durham as a part of the sit-in movement. And, of course, I had the only experience of, of uh, seeing Malcolm in person on our campus uh, at North Carolina Central, but I only saw him from the back because the administration had run him off campus. And um, But that was the height of the Vietnamese you know, the, the war in Vietnam as well. And so when I graduated in 66 uh, to duck the draft, I joined Volunteers in Service to America, the, Amer the uh, domestic peace corps, so to speak, and got shipped off to uh, Chicago. And on the south side of Chicago, there were two institutions that impacted me greatly. Cum University with Dr. Bobby Wright, Andy Thompson, Jay Carruthers, and others. <coughs> and also the Black People's Topographical Research Center. And, uh, and so from the civil rights environment and the sit-ins in the South, uh, then to the Black Nationalist, uh, Pan-Africanist perspective, and of course the Nation of Islam there as well. By the way, my mother became uh, a, a member of the Nation of Islam, so part of my influence very early was sitting in the mosque every week. And I never became a member, but heavily influenced. So while in Chicago, uh, to go to graduate school, I moved to Wisconsin to go to the uh, School of Graduate Work at the uh, uh, Milwaukee campus of the University of Wisconsin. And so that was where she and I began to uh, connect. But uh, from the civil rights movement and sit-ins, uh, being pissed on, being cut with glass that uh, the races would throw at us uh, to then being in the, in the, the uh, environment, very nourishing environment of the community university uh, on the south side of Chicago and then going to Milwaukee and a part of the black 
uh, the movement to, in, uh, to infuse black studies on the university campus. If you don't mind, talk to us a little bit about your early history and also what led you to the university where you eventually met uh, Baba Hakeem. Thank you. Well, in my early years, I'll have to say that I was influenced not with the interaction with my grandmother, but with the stories that were told about her. Uh, because I lived in, my family and I lived in Wisconsin, and uh, she was still here in Georgia. But I would hear these stories about her and how she dealt with um, the Caucasians at the time. And that at the time when she was coming up, it was very, very dangerous for black people in any sense of the word. Um, but I respected the things that I heard about her. Um, one of my favorite stories was that when, during those years, uh, oftentimes and most often, uh, black women and black girls had to work in the homes of the uh, white folk. And this was something that my grandmother said she would die and go to hell before she'd let my mother work in their homes because she knew what could happen in those homes. So that was one thing, but um, there were many stories about her. Then, And I was also influenced by uh, my older brother, who was a very positive figure in my life and very positive about black just, people. Just, just hanging around with him, and he had no brothers, so I would be his little brother. <laughs> and, um, you know, he'd talk, he would talk about, you know, our plight as a people. And I didn't quite understand the things that he talked about, but after I got older, you know, I reflected on it, and I could see where he was coming from at that time. Then later on, during my high school years, there, uh, we uh, had our, our high school was all black, and they were we were getting a new high school in our community. And when we were actually slated to get this new high school, they wanted to bust us out and let the white folk come over there, and we would go to the south side to their school. Well, uh, I was a part of that struggle to to help to keep. Uh, our school black and by the time we got the school I had graduated but you know I still hung in there with that fight and we, we it was victorious we got our school um, then also there were uh, during during the uh, civil rights movement I remember there was a Catholic priest who was leading a march to Washington from um, from uh, Milwaukee and uh, my mom and I would you know uh, fried chicken and make ba you know picnic baskets, if you will, and take it to them. I could never see myself following, uh, although the ideas were great that he talked about, but I just couldn't quite get behind him. Um, I wanted somebody that looked like me that I would follow, or you know walk side by side with. Then, of course, uh, later I met Hikima, and then his involvement with the Republic of New Africa was just. It was just a whole new world that opened up to me. I was just so into it. I just, it was like, this is what I've been looking for all my life. And um, that was the beginning of my really, really getting involved with the black struggle. Bob Hikima, talk to us a little bit about, the, you know, the connection that you two had uh, on the university campus and, and, and where, where the, uh, the political aspects of of our people where we were at that time and some of the things that that you you know got involved in through the republic of new africa that eventually led to several other things but just kind of give us a little bit of that history in terms of you know the initial meeting and your political you know your political uh influence on mama tamu well uh this was a time uh 67 68 when uh, uh, black students on white campuses were um, highly motivated. In other words, the, our, our struggle in the streets influenced everybody. Mm -hmm. I often talk about uh, the fact that uh, I can remember uh, little shorties, little brothers and sisters, three and four years old with their little fists in the air, mm -hmm. saying, saying brother and sister. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, was, it was a norm. And so certainly... Uh, those of us on on the white campuses uh, and the black campuses as well were influenced, 
And so we were involved in a movement to uh, infuse black studies into the, uh, into the curriculum on the campus. And so my wife and I and others went to uh, Ithaca, New York, mm -hmm. uh, to a, a national conference on, on black studies. And it was at that conference that the Republic of New Africa that was founded in 68 out of Detroit. And by the way, uh, when it was founded, uh, Robert Williams, who was then in exile in China, was elected president. Uh, Betty Shabazz was, Malcolm's widow was elected vice president. Uh, several other people had ministries. Uh, Karenga had a ministry. H. Rap Brown had a ministry. Uh, Imam Baraka had a ministry. So it was a collection of, of um, uh, thinkers and scholars and activists around the country. So they, at the convention in Cornell, well, it, wasn't, it was Cornell. It wasn't it. It was Cornell University, uh, well, whatever the city is. Uh, they made a presentation, and hundreds of us students became citizens of the Republic of New Africa, a provisional government. And so after the, um, that conference, we, we went back to our respective cities. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the Republic of New Africa reached out to us and convinced us to begin to organize locally there in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, what would be called a government unit or a consulate. And so we came together around the work of building a uh, presence of the Republic of New Africa in, uh, in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. In addition, the building where we actually acquired to do that work was shared with the uh, Black People's Topical Research Center out of Chicago. So in one location, we had both of these dynamic forces taking place and influencing us as well. And uh, of course, this is 68, 69, 70. And of course, uh, one of the things that uh, we're going to talk about a little bit more extensively is what happened in 1971. I'm not sure you're ready to go to that. But uh, as a part of our work in building and expanding the, uh, the presence of the provisional government, the RNA, uh, in Milwaukee, I later became a national leader. And I, I emerged as a vice president. And um, in 1971, uh, my wife and I uh, drove from Milwaukee to uh, Jackson, Mississippi, on our way to North Carolina. Sometimes we explain it a little differently. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, but the Republic of New Africa uh, was on J. Edgar Hoover's list of organizations and institutions to infiltrate, to destroy, as a part of the COINTELPRO operation. The same tactics that were used for the Panthers and for, for the attacks on, on progressive organizations, we were a part of that as well. And by and large, uh, the, 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 uh, the Republic of New Africa were youth. You know, we were in our mid-20s. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're mid-20s and early 20s. And the leadership... Uh, in was young as well. Some, you know, Mario Bedelli was older uh, as the president. Sister Dara Bubikare was older as as an official as well. But myself and, uh, for instance, uh, Chokwe Lamuma, the our, our brother who uh, became mayor of uh, Jackson, Mississippi, he and I were the young guns, so to speak. So again, in our mid twenties. Uh, and so uh, the Republic of New Africa had two houses that they used as headquarters in Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, because we were guests in the cities, uh, we were able to, to, uh, uh, to rest overnight before our trip to, uh, further to North Carolina. And it just so happens that the FBI and the local police had planned to raid the houses uh, while we were, I'm sure that when they saw that myself and other people who were in leadership were all in the same place at the same time, they, uh, they prepared. 
Uh, just to give you an idea of... This is the FBI along with local authorities? FBI and local authorities. Uh, so on the morning of August the 18th, 1971, they initiated a raid on a residential house in a black community, a wood frame house, totally surrounded the house. Our media was present. There had been a armored personnel carrier borrowed from another state, borrowed from Shelby County, uh, Tennessee. Same armored personnel carrier that John, what that um, Kennedy's assassin. Lee Harvey, Lee Harvey Oswald had been had been uh, no King's assassin. Oh, King's assassin. King's assassin oh, okay. in 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 in, oh, in, uh, in, Memphis. in Memphis. In Memphis, the same armored personnel character that he had been in. Mm -hmm. So that armored personnel character ended up in Mississippi. Uh, that again, the press was there. Uh, refreshments were there. Mm -hmm. You know, when when the community began to let us know what had happened. You know, they were ready for a picnic. Yeah. Mm. You know, they so were ready for... this going to be in 71, equivalent to a modern-day lynching. Exactly. That they were coming to get some entertainment out of it. Yeah, yeah. And so so what occurred is that at sunrise, uh, they announced on a bullhorn that you have 75 seconds to come out of the house as the FBI and local police come out of the house. So you, you, you all were in the house. How we were in the were, house. How many people total were in the house? Seven in our house and four at the other house. Okay. Okay. Now, and the reason uh, we can say what the FBI said, because we didn't hear because we were asleep. Okay. But so the F Real early in the morning. Real early in the morning. But the FBI, who, who actually was at the bullhorn, got on the stand. And said basically what he said. Mm -hmm. So he identified himself as the FBI and local police one time. Okay. And gave us 75 seconds to come out of the house. And, uh, and they never identified themselves again. Now, in our house, all of us were asleep. In the other house, people were up doing work. And so uh, when the FBI and local police surrounded their, that house, people came out and said, what are you, what, 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 what are you here for? We could have done the same thing. None of us in either house were wanted for anything. Okay. Clean records, everything. But in our house situation where we were asleep, after the 75 seconds, then they began to shoot into the house. Mm -hmm. They say that they didn't shoot uh, bullets. Well, they say they only shot uh, tear gas projectiles. But glass is breaking, plaster is falling off the wall, you know, those tear gas projectors are lethal weapons. They're shot from, mm -hmm. you know. And so we, of course, were prepared to defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, uh, we had been attacked. The RNA had been attacked earlier, maybe in 68. There was a shootout at uh, Aretha Franklin's father's church. And uh, in that situation, um, a police officer was wounded and, and died as well. And, uh, of course, everybody in the church was arrested. And a courageous judge, Judge Crockett, in, in Detroit released everybody. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, verified for that. But anyway, in our situation, after 75 seconds, and when they began to shoot into the house, um, we returned fire. At some point, we realized that there were uniformed uh, officers outside. So they began firing on the house. Yes. What what is what what is it like in the house as these shots are coming through projectiles, plaster falling from yeah. the walls? What's that what's that environment like, Mama Tamu, for you all um, as as the federal authorities and local police began to shoot up shoot up the house and you see uh, people begin to return fire in self defense? It seemed at first just like total chaos because you're waking up to a barrage of bullets and tear gas, what I perceive to be bullets and tear gas, you know, and, and you're, you're smelling this, you're choking on it, you know, and you're trying to get some clothes on. Um, so it was just, it was just a, a, like a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And of course, with her and the other sister that was in the house, the two sisters, mm -hmm. uh, one of the young brothers uh, came to them and pulled them to safety. 
uh, because the, the, the youth who were there had been ex expecting an attack, not from the police, but from the vigilantes and the Klan, mm -hmm. they had bored a hole in the floor. So they grabbed the sisters and immediately took them down uh, underneath the structure. Did you want to say something about that? Yeah, I wanted to say that that was um, the, the brother who uh, came and got us was very young. I think he was like 17 or, or younger. And these brothers had been trained so well uh, by the leadership that they, I mean, it was, there was no question in his mind about arrest, uh, uh, you know, getting us and taking us to safety. When the most impressive thing about that was when he got us in the tunnel, he didn't just get us there. He laid his body on top of us, over us, so that if, you know, the bullets came, they would get him and not, and not us. How great is that? Mm -hmm. I mean, for a young brother. Yeah. I mean, you, you're talking about some training. The brothers was ready. They were great. So you return fire. Yeah, a, a few of us returned fire. Um, <clears throat> and after, uh, it was I who spotted. Uh, well, all of us eventually, you know, not eventually because it wasn't that long, we all went underneath the house. Okay. So how long was the, was the shootout? They say 20 minutes. I don't think it was that long. Okay. I don't think it was that long. But this is a wood frame house. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the structure was riddled. Mm -hmm. I had a brand new car outside. I had a brand new Volvo. <laughs> that was riddled as well, <laughs> as well. And uh, but we were now. I, I. Bullets were whisking by me, so I, I, I sensed that there were shots fired that could have hit me. But again, we all went underneath the house, and for a time, that was just rip, the, rip, the the house was just being riddled uh, with bullets, and so. Eventually, I, uh, from underneath the house and open it, I spotted a uniform officer. And then I said, these, these are police. Mm -hmm. You know, these are whatever. Let's, let's holler for, you know, for some closure. So we began to holler, stop fire. And uh, so then the fire stopped. <clears throat> and we emerged from the house, and then it took us and put us on the ground. Mm -hmm. And they say, who, is that? who else is in the house? And we said, nobody. They didn't believe us mm -hmm. because they, come, they couldn't, believe, they couldn't believe that nobody was dead in that house because three of them were wounded. Mm -hmm. One fatally wounded, uh, shot in the head, another shot in the chest, and another shot in the leg. Also the police. Police. Oh, they was wounded. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So none of us were wounded. Uh, again, it's a miracle. It's, it's miraculous. Uh, this is North Carolina? This is Jackson, Mississippi. This is Jackson, Mississippi. In, in 71. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so while we were lying on the ground, they continued. When when we emerged from the house, and they didn't because they didn't believe us, they continued to fire tear gas into the house. And for a good while, they weren't they weren't going into the house. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I'm sure was in their minds: ain't no way y'all gonna get off. You know, and none of you are wounded. And three of us are wounded, one dead. And so, uh, but by that time, this story is around the world. I mean, it's in Europe, it's in China, it's, it's everywhere. It's a global incident. Can you show that picture one more time? I'm going to show it on the, on the camera. Uh, yeah, if you keep talking, I'm going to show it right Okay. Um, and so, again, that the picture that you, you're referring to mm -hmm. emerges when we are arrested and taken and marched in the street, in the street are pretty much naked. Um, uh, my wife had on a robe, right? I had a coat. So this you had a coat? Over my gown. This is you here. Correct. Oh, this is the brother right here. Okay. That's him. And, a, and of course, we never had a chance to put on a shirt. Or a jacket or anything, okay. and um, so. Um, so that's the brother right there talking. That's him. Okay, so um, we were marched in the streets. In other words, that picture I don't know who took it, but anyone could have taken it because, uh, again, we were paraded, right. mm -hmm. and uh, with the chains, 
and uh, creative artists later put on a, a put a poster up with that picture beside a picture of enslaved Africans being marched to the dungeons uh, to go on to the slave ships, and uh, you know you know the contrast wasn't that that great. It was similar, and so again. Uh, the seven of us in the house that, where the shootout occurred and the four of us in the house where the shootout did not occur were all lumped together on conspiracy charges. And we became the RNA 11. So the Republic of New Africa 11. 11. So the shootout resulted in one federal agent uh, being killed? No. One local one police local being killed, killed. Okay. one federal agent being shot. And the local police being shot, okay. right. yeah, but the 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 the, the conspiracy charges. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> See, initially we were charged with uh, treason, leveling war against the state of Mississippi, uh, conspiracy, murder, and then an sundry of gun charges as well, other charges as well. So I'm not sure how many charges were there. And of course, this was a time when the death penalty was alive and well in Mississippi. Uh, the electric chair was still operational. So uh, because of the conspiracy uh, aspect, several of us went on trial for murder. I was the first to go on trial for murder because they said that they, uh, through their forensic, determined that I fired the weapon that killed the police. I don't know how they could do that, but, you know, that's what they did. So they, they said that you were responsible for the murder of that that police officer. They they pinned that on you. They pinned that on me. What was what was the status of Mama Tamu um, when when the arrest was made? So you all were arrested. Right. But what 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 happened with, with the sisters? Conspiracy. Okay. So they had the sh the charges as well. They they had it as well. Now luckily, the, 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 that part of their charge was weak, mm -hmm. and Tamu, you got out. And how 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 much time did you spend? I spent 10 months uh, incarcerated. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was between uh, Jackson, uh, the Hines County uh, Jail, and then you went to another jail as well? Actually, I went through to several jails there. Um, I went, of course, to Hines County, to Parchman, to Meridian, mm -hmm. and there was one other one that I can't remember, but... Um, that one, the brothers didn't go to. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think you all went to Meridian either. No. no. But, uh, yeah, I went to a, several jails. And also I wanted to say that uh, the other sister that was in the house uh, was pregnant at the time. Okay. And so she, she was eventually released. And there was another sister in the other house where the shooting did not take place. Uh, she was able to be released very early in the game. Okay. Mm -hmm. The sister she, that was expecting mm -hmm. when the arrest was made, mm -hmm. was she still incarcerated when she gave birth? Or no. Was she, okay, so no. She no, let me backtrack. The, the first sister to get out, uh, who was not in the house with us, um, she had a, a, a relative who was a big-time attorney in, from New York, mm -hmm. and he was able to come down, and I don't know how, but he was able to get her out very soon. Okay. But uh, the other sister who was pregnant, she was able to get out because of her pregnancy. Okay. And so it just left me. <laughs> but she was, she, was, she, was, she was roughed up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there, there was some complications it because was. of the, the maltreatment. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so in 1972, I went on trial. Uh, death penalty trial. Death penalty case. In the state of Mississippi. Really? Yeah. In 1971. 72. 72. The shootout occurred in 71, but the trial in 72. And uh, uh, at that time... Um, the pressure and all of facing the death penalty. If you see pictures of me then, I was very frail uh, and uh, had lost weight and everything. But anyway, we... sprayed you in the face, remember? But that was afterwards. That was after when we were at Parchment. Um, so an all-white jury saved one elderly black man. Uh, and so the jury came back with a verdict of guilty. Uh, but the... It was in two phases, the, 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 and the sentencing phase and the penalty phase. In the penalty phase, they could not find themselves to take my life. Uh, so I ended up with life in prison without parole. 
And, uh, and then the following year were the federal trials. Uh, and, but again, between my trial and the federal trials, there were other state trials. So not only did I get a life sentence, um, Ofaga got a life yes. sentence, uh, Karim got a life sentence, and then, um, then there were other lesser charges. Um, artists didn't get a life sentence, right? Mm -hmm. No, okay. But there were lesser charges. In other words, the, the evidence clearly indicated myself and the other brothers who got life sentences being in a self-defense mode. So, uh, so life sentence without parole, and of course there was only one prison in the state of Mississippi. That was Parchman Prison Farm. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of us who looked at the movie Life with Eddie Murphy and I'm not sure the other people, it's very descriptive of Parchman. It was an environment where inmates had guns, and they were the ones who, if you were out of lines, they shot you, <laughs> you know. And so it was a it was farm. Actually farm. When I first got there, I cropped, I mean, I uh, pulled cotton. When you, when you pick it when it's nice and white, they call that picking cotton. And later on, when you go get the scraps, when it's in the fall and it's, the leaves are, are brown, you call it pulling cotton. So I did that at Parson Prison Farm. But uh, federally, uh, any number of us got time as well including Brother Imari, who was in the other house mm -hmm. on conspiracy charges. Right. And, and uh, Tawab, who was in the other house, who uh, got time on conspiracy charges. And so we ended up with 15 years on top of the state time. Okay. And that was a blessing. Because what ended up happening is that uh, because of the... Uh, the federal time, it uh, allowed us to uh, to eventually get out of the state situation. But I don't want to go there yet. But what I want to do is uh, reflect on Tamu. Okay. Tamu got out in 10 months. She could have gone anywhere. She could have done anything. But her commitment to family, you know, here I am. I've got a life sentence without parole and 15 years on top of that. And she wants to build a family. So now, she get out and see her commitment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm in no, I'm in no position to say no, right? <laughs> but uh, I'm not seeing what she's saying. I'm saying, ain't no way in the world I'm going to get out of this. I know they got a graveyard already dug at, at the farm for me because that's what happens. People with natural life sentences are buried for the most part on the farm unless their families get their bodies and bring them home. So there's a cemetery there. You know, it's already got my name on it. But she, that ain't what she sees. She sees a family. Now, it's just the two of us. We don't, we don't have a family yet. And so I don't know what she sees, you know. I, <laughs> you know but she's committed. <clears throat> you know, she's, she's all in. So what, what was on your mind, um, Mama Tamu? Um, Baba Hakeem has, has obviously been convicted. Um, life sentence plus 15 years and you get it in your mind I mean you obviously like Baba Hakima says you see something else you see something else and you're going by what you see so talk talk to us a little bit about what you saw that prompted you to take action I don't know I guess I had rose colored glasses on <laughs> um, it, and it's kind of hard to explain it's just that it didn't phase me um, in terms of how long he had I knew he would be there for a while but I knew he was coming home and mm. m I guess my thing in terms of building a family is that um, I got to do this while I can and because uh, who knows when he's going to come home so you know we got to go ahead and live we can't you know we're going to live until we die and that's the way I wanted to live I wanted to have these children and you know we'd be there when he comes home so mm -hmm. it was. So you was making visits. Oh yeah, we had. You was getting, um, you know, what they had back then. Um, the conjugal visits. Conjugal visits, mm -hmm. sleepover visits. Right. We had that too, but you. you said, well, I'm gonna make this family because I'm yeah. for him to come home. And take absolutely, care of him. absolutely. Talk about that. Yeah, well, you you had visits, um, where you can go, um, 
and it was kind of weird uh, because you'd see sisters coming with their blankets and stuff or the brothers carrying from there wherever they were. And you, you, you just went in these little houses and stayed there for a period of time. And then somebody else would go in there. So, um, and then you also had uh, what we call the three-day visit where you can come and actually live with, with your husband for three, you know, blissful days, you know. And um, one of the little places that they had, it was like, it was, it was really neat. Uh, it was like, um, like a, a motel type of things, like with, with like three or four apartments right there. Now, those were really nice, but they, they also had these real big houses that were old kind of decrepit like you know um, the windows didn't have screens and just open windows you know and stuff so those weren't very nice but as long as we were together you know it was it was nice okay. yeah and so you know we we would every time he would get an opportunity to have uh, his three-day visit you know we were there uh, I went so much that um, back then you know when you get your airline ticket you know you went to the uh, uh, to the airline, to the, their off one of their offices and bought your ticket, or, or, or I guess you could go to the airport. But however, I would go downtown in Wisconsin and I would go to the Delta, um, their office and get my tickets. And a young lady asked me. She says, "Do you have a job in Mississippi?" <laughs> <laughs> I said, "I said no. Why do you ask?" She said, "Well, you seem to go so often." So, so I did. I made quite a few trips. I always say that. Um, our oldest daughter, when she was, by the time, um, she had a, if, when she was two, she had had a flight for every month of her age. That, that's considered going there and back. Yeah, so. But you also moved to Mississippi. I did. Um, after, well, first of all, when I was released, I went back to school, and I uh, got my degree in everything, in, edu in education. And I um, started working, and then... Uh, I had an opportunity to move to Mississippi, so I did. But by this time, uh, we'd had two daughters. And um, I moved Got to the job uh, with the, uh, it, it, at a university in Itabina, Mississippi. And um, I, before that, though, I was, in my mind, I thought it would be really cool if I would move uh, on the prison farm, because they had educators there you know for the guys um and I thought wow see could then we could really have a nice family and and of course he said no way and my mom was like mm -mm, you, you ain't going on no farm but anyway um but I mean I considered that and uh, but then again as I said we moving there it was you know we got a little apartment and we could make our visits every weekend so, so well, you decide mm -hmm. you decide mama that you ain't you ain't waiting. You're going right. to start a family. Absolutely. And you begin to have children. Absolutely. While Baba Hakima is in prison, mm -hmm. serving a life sentence plus 15 years, yeah. you start a family. Right. Some might call it insane, but I thought it was just the most normal thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you got out, you didn't just go back home. You, you also... Uh, Fought for us. Absolutely, uh, I certainly for did. For prisoners in mm -hmm. general, mm -hmm. right? Uh, born stormin' around the country mm -hmm. with Angela Davis and other people, right? Um, because a lot of us were were incarcerated mm -hmm. around the country, right? As a result of the war on us mm -hmm. and the and the youth in our movement, right? When they interviewed me uh, in Mississippi the day that I got out, um, I remember saying that I would leave no stone unturned. Uh, for getting these brothers out, you know, I would just give my life to that, and that, and that's kind of what I did. I did go, like I said, I went back to school, but I was also, um, you know, traveling and, and speaking mm -hmm. on their behalf. So you went on a campaign to bring mm -hmm. awareness uh, to the plight of the RNA-11 and to yes. raise funds yes, for, for yes. their defense. Absolutely, I okay. sure did. All mm -hmm. the while having children. All the while, yeah, having children. I did slow down after the children came, but I would still eat. What would happen is that um, the brothers would 
call me if they needed a sister to go and speak, because a lot of times the brothers would speak, but if they would need uh, a sister to go to speak, it was two of us that they would send out. Okay. And, um, you know, so I would go at every opportunity that I got. So mm -hmm. what, what, what were you thinking, Baba mm -hmm. Hakeem? Mama Tamu Mama? tells you um, that the two of you are now expecting a, a child. Again, you are serving a life sentence plus 15 years, and she decides to start a family. Well, I'm not so sure, uh, all the feelings. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I reflect on that um, people around my mother would say, well, now you're not going to have any grandchildren. And uh, that weighed heavily on me. Mm -hmm. You know, the f I'm an only child. Nope. And for uh, people around my mother to say to her that she's never going to have any grandchildren, well, Tamu proved them wrong, of course, mm -hmm. obviously. And so uh, that was a joy. Um, and, of course, uh, my first two children were able to come to Parchment and be with me. Mm -hmm. uh, Shay was only able to come uh, to visit me after I was in the federal custody. But uh, so it's, uh, again, it's kind of unreal in some respects because I don't have any idea of how I would ever join them. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Uh, it's it's um, uh, it's a mixed kind of situation. Uh, you're joyful, but you're you're sorrowful too because you 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 don't see the opportunity to join them. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Now, my question goes for Shay. How does it feel, Shay, when you learn later on in the years that you were one of the children? that your mother wanted to bring life to and bring forth to the, to the world. How does it feel when you hear the story of your mother and your father? Um, to be honest with you, I'm probably not going to be able to say much. Um, I'm, I'm extremely proud, you know, for them to be my parents. And... Um, Every time I hear their story, as you can see, it's, um, it's really emotional just to think of the sacrifice that they made for, no, for African people. And for my mother to have the vision that she had and the want that she did for a family is just, it's, it's beyond me. It's like unreal. Um, and one thing that probably makes me very emotional is that when we were younger, I know my sister, my eldest sister is five years older than me. Um, our middle, or their middle child, my old, my sister right above me, Noni. Um, she and I, when we were younger, couldn't look at the pictures um, of my father and what they did to him while, while he was in prison. So, I'm ex again, I'm extremely proud, but I don't think that there'll ever be a time in my life that this doesn't happen because when you think of the people who nurtured you, taught you, loved you, your mommy and your daddy had this type of energy, love, fortitude for their people. It's just an amazing, amazing thing. So, um, I see. You, you know, as you know, just like Shay said, um, as often as, as I hear the story and I replay it in my mind all the time, um, I'm amazed as well, you know, to know that when, when somebody mentions the name Baba Hakima and Mama Tamu, the word that comes to mind to me that really encapsulates them is sacrifice. You know, if there, if there was one word that I would use to describe them and what they mean uh, to our people, is sacrifice and to be able to come together to, to tell this story, our story, um, is like one of the most powerful experiences that I think I have personally had. Uh, and I know many of the viewers and, and eventually the, the, the hundreds of thousands of people that will see this video via YouTube will walk away knowing that there are people right in our midst that have sacrificed so much, you know whose names we may not even know, whose story we may not even know, you know. So it just, 
you talk about elders, you know, and, and these are the types of people that we have among us. And so we stand on their shoulders while they are still here in the physical realm. We stand on their shoulders because not only uh, and we'll get back to to the story because it, it you know, it's it's a, it's, you know, Mama Tamu and the campaign that she went on to free her husband all the while having children. She goes on a national campaign to bring awareness to their plight, but to also raise funds. Right. And in their relationship with Baba Chokwe Lumumba, who eventually became the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, the same town where the shootout happened. He was also your defense attorney. A am I right about that? Or he had some role? Uh, yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, 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 Tamu, her name, Hakima, and my name was given to us by Chokwe in a naming ceremony. So, yeah, he, uh, during my trial, I think he was still in law school. But anyway, he, he participated on the defense team for us. Exactly. Now, one of the things, and I'm not sure how much time we got here, one of the things that's a mystery to people is to how you eventually got out. Right. <clears throat> and I want to make sure that people don't assume that we, we made some kind of deal to get out of prison. Right. <laughs> you know, it wasn't that, <laughs> you know. And so um, the prisoners in Mississippi had uh, come together with their attorneys to uh, go into federal court and um, uh, charge the state of Miss the uh, prison with being overpopulated. And so uh, Parchman Prison Farm <clears throat> was under a federal court order to depopulate. They had to get rid of the numbers. And so the uh, prison administration made a blanket decision that they would release all of the inmates who had time to serve in other jurisdictions. Administratively, that included us. It was never supposed to include us. Right. So the federal prison bus came to pick us up, those of us who were at Parchment at that time, <clears throat> and brought us to Atlanta, Atlanta Federal Penitentiary here. Mm. The very next day we were back in Parchment. Mm. Because once the word got out that the RNA prisoners had been released, and I'm not sure, I'm sure some people lost their jobs around that, but we were back in state custody the very next day. Wow. Our attorneys went to work uh, to uh, in federal court and our position was that Mississippi, once they allowed us to leave uh, the state of Mississippi under the jurisdiction of the feds, mm -hmm. they could never get us back. So them bringing you back to Parchment was illegal? No. Essentially? Them releasing us releasing to the feds. Okay. In other words, letting us out. Right, exactly. And so we were able to prevail on that argument. Mm -hmm. We so won a technicality. A technicality. Mm -hmm. So... They relinquished jurisdiction and could never get it back. All right. Now, the feds also committed an error. They should have never released us back to Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So the time we spent back in Mississippi had to count for federal time. They, they wouldn't uh, allow the feds to lose jurisdiction. But uh, the court ruling was that when our federal time started, when they released us to federal custody. Mississippi could never get us back, and the time that we did spend, more than a year, back in Mississippi, I'm not sure how long it was, but uh, that time counted towards federal time. So when we won our case in federal court that the state of Mississippi had lost jurisdiction on us, then we went back to federal court to begin, not to start serving the time, but just to finish out the, the little time that uh, we had still left. And so I was paroled uh, from, the f from federal custody in 1980. And again, my federal time was all spent here in Atlanta. And it was at that time that I made a decision to broker with Tamu and, 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 and our children for us to move to Atlanta. So when I got out in 80, we spent a year in Wisconsin, and then in 81, we moved to Atlanta. And we've been here ever since. Um, but again, uh, my two older daughters uh, visited me at Parchment. Uh, Allende, my oldest daughter, visited several times. Mm -hmm. 
Noni, I don't think, visited but one time. No, she visited, she visited quite, a few quite a few times. But I remember her. Uh, there's a crazy thing that happens at um, Parchman, similar to Angola. They have the rodeo. Right. The crazy thing where where uh, inmates put themselves in front of these bulls and everything else to be, be maimed. But I just remember Noni at the prison rodeo uh, running through my legs. But again, I, Shay visited me at, uh, at the farm, I mean at the uh, 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 federal prison here in Atlanta. And one of the things I reflect on all the time, the shootout with the firepower that the police and the FBI had, it was miraculous that we survived. Then the death penalty case, it was miraculous that we survived that without having gone to the gas, to, to electric chair. And then the prison stay itself, it was to be, it was to be for a lifetime. We survived that. And uh, uh, for myself, I was involved in an automobile accident. Uh, not too long ago. And uh, one of my wife's cousins is a trucker. <clears throat> and he was listening uh, to the dispatch and hearing the, um, the announcements to truckers and to people on those CB radios, avoid this area, there's been a fatal fatality. There's a wreck. You know, that was me. You know, but I survived it. Mm -hmm. And so it, it often uh, um, comes up in my mind that the ancestors have saved me for some some reason, so I best be mindful of what I do <laughs> and be thankful, in fact. But uh, in 1980, uh, got out a very precious brother, uh, Joe Brooks, uh, his African name is Yusuf, who picked me up from the prison. Uh, he's a brother who had written an article that got published uh, nationally about black uh uh, land loss in the South, mm -hmm. and uh, he got a million dollar grant to uh, uh, to help black farmers in the South uh, maintain their land, and the agency was the Emergency Land Fund, and so he picked me up, brought me to the, took me to the bus station, and I rode the bus to, to Milwaukee to meet my family, and when we came back to Atlanta, uh, I was paroled uh, here, and my job was with the Emergency Land Fund, uh, the brothers who had picked me up. And so that was my first immersion into uh, the, 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 the cooperatives and the farmers in the South. And uh, so we were thinking cooperative then uh, in 1981 when we first moved to Atlanta. And so that became dormant for a while until – you know, we got together and began to think through the mechanics of how we would raise an institution to answer the economic imperative that we talk about. But I just marvel at the fact, I remember, um, uh, what's the, histor the, the, uh, the brother here at uh, Georgia State University, Asa Hilliard. Uh, there's a video when he talks about a love story where uh, his one of his ancestors, uh, after emancipation, walked from in Georgia, maybe it was, all the way out west and crossed the Mississippi on foot to find his mate. Mm -hmm. You know, and so there are those stories, and of course, uh, you know, I have to look at at my wife and uh, you know, and and know that. Uh, her story needs to be told. She's still trying to write a book about it. <laughs> but she ends up being so involved in the community, she doesn't have time yeah. to write. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I, I don't know how she'll ever do it, but uh, somebody else has to grab a hold of her and to, to make that happen. Mama Tamu, I definitely want you to offer some closing words um, for the sisters, you know, because your story is so powerful and your example is so uh, powerful as well. What would you say or what do you say uh, to sisters all over the country and all over the world uh, to them to just let them know, you know, the, the greatness of that African woman, that spirit that once you get it in your mind to do, there is really nothing that will stop you. Well, 
I guess the if the spirit if you have the spirit of our people of our ancestors, you have the love of family. Um, th that's your ammunition, and that's what keeps you strong. Um, and I don't say because some people would say, well, you know, um, as, as long as you love a person, um, that's that's what'll do it. And I don't say to. Um, I think you have to also love yourself and some other, and, and as I said, love, love uh, black people, love, mm -hmm. you know, what you're doing, because it's not just the love of that individual. If you have a righteous person and you believe in them that they are a righteous person with a righteous cause um, and you love them, you know, I think that together will build, will be the building blocks that you need. And then, again, as I said, if you love family. So, how long have you have you been married? Forty forty five years will be forty six this summer. Forty six years this summer. Mm -hmm. I finally found somebody to beat me. <laughs> <laughs> forty six for years. years. Yeah, all right. Yes. So, brothers and sisters, this is why Brother Sarnetta and I had to title this an African love story. This serves as a excellent example of black love and something that we should really marvel in that we have these people among us that we are able to sit at their feet and gain so much of their wisdom and insight on not only the history of our movement but the history of what brought them together under the banner of African liberation. This is another Sarnet exclusive, Brother Sarnet here in Atlanta along with the board of us lifting us and we want to thank you for watching. All of you who will eventually tune in um, to the YouTube upload, you can find out more about us uh, at our website at usliftingus.com. That's usliftingus.com. Thank you, family. Peace. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, I've never seen that picture. Yeah, we gotta yeah, cause we gotta stop by the hotel and um get some equipment and, and make it make it on our way. But luckily we're not we're only thirty minutes away from from where we gotta go, so yeah. Let's get it. Okay, this is just the beginning. So we got everything. Okay. But it needs to be copied from the original in the copies. For this? Or from yeah, the original, the original uh, publication. I want to come back on it. I want to come back Can we get a copy of, even though it's a copy of a copy, can we still get a couple of those made? I'll, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll talk to him. He can make a copy. But it's be identical.